Welcome to the first of the videos for MG5004, which is also taught as DE5418. All we have to do in this course is actually go right back to the beginning. Um, some of you have done this in the diploma course, some of you haven't done the diploma course, but you do have the required prerequisites. But we're just going to cover everything in case there's something that you've forgotten along the way. So some of you may need to just Bear with me as we go through this, others of you will appreciate the, the revision. So the first type of numbers that we meet are the natural numbers. They are the whole numbers, the natural numbers. And we, we talk about these as, as numerals. So let's look at the natural numbers. The natural numbers are the ones that are 1, 2, 3 and so on, things that we can actually count. We need to be able to deal with numbers where we take, say, eight away from five. So we've got these natural numbers and we, we need to be now able to manipulate them. So what if we wanted to take away eight from five, then it's not in that first set. So we need to develop this idea of negative numbers and then we'll include those in our set of integers, which we could look at being from, say, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, including 0, and so on. We need to, to talk about real numbers. We need to talk about rational numbers. Now, a rational number doesn't just mean one that's sane. A rational number is one that we can write as a ratio, like that. Then we can talk about the irrational numbers. And an irrational number is something that we can't for example, root 2, we can't write as something over something. And we couldn't write pi. We can approximate pi as 22 over 7, but it's not actually pi. So we talk about those as being irrational numbers. And if we look at the combined effect of those, if we have the set of rational numbers and the set of irrational numbers and join them together, then we get the set of real numbers, which we denote by that kind of solid R. It's quite useful sometimes to visualise the, the numbers and, and where they fit as a set. So we've looked at natural numbers right at the middle here, then whole numbers, then integers, and then the dark green here would be real numbers, which is made up of the rational numbers and the irrational numbers. But over the top of that are numbers that are not real. And we'll see in week 14, when we talk about, uh, no, not week 14, I'm not sure. We, we'll talk about these as complex numbers. So these are not real numbers. So they're outside real numbers. Just quickly running through this, that addition is commutative, but subtraction isn't. Commutative means the order doesn't matter. Obviously, it matters with subtraction. Uh, the, for multiplication, the order is not important, and we talk about multiplication being commutative. The idea of A times B plus C, that's what that says, means that everything inside the bracket is multiplied by A. So A times B plus A times C. And we talk about that as being the distributive property. So it, it works for subtraction as well. A times B minus C is the same as AB minus AC. So there's the commutative law and there's the distributive law. We've got another law here where we've got things that are associated together as denoted by brackets. So here we're talking about the associative law of addition. And we can also have the same with multiplication. We can predetermine, if you like, what is multiplying by what by the use of brackets. And that is more of the associative law of 
multiplication. We can distribute division over addition. So we've got division outside here and addition here. So we talk about this as being the distributive law of division over addition. And similarly, in the last example on the slide, we are distributing division over subtraction. I'm sure you know the and, and need no reminding that positive times positive is a positive and positive times negative, whichever way you do it is a negative and negative times negative is positive and the same for division. I'm sure you remember that, but just it's still true. So that we get the same answer as everybody else when we're doing maths, we need to have some order, some set of rules and bod mass or bed mass. Sometimes this of is also, we talk about order, and order is just an American word for power or exponents. So if we've got them, we're going to do them after we do brackets, before we do division and multiplication. Now, just a reminder that these division and multiplication are the same kind of level in the hierarchy as our addition and subtraction. So if we've just got divide and multiply, then we work left to right. And if we've just got addition and subtraction, we work left to right. If we've got a mix, then we follow bed mass, bod mass, whatever you like to to call it. But just remember there are two exceptions that if we've just got division and subtraction we work left to right and the same with addition and subtraction. Some rules of inequalities that you need to remember. If we've got a is less than b and c is less than d then we can say that a plus c must be less than b plus d. Now all of these you can you can check using examples. If a is less than b and c is greater than d, then a minus c is going to be less than b minus d. If a is less than b and b is less than c, then a must be less than c. If we have two numbers a is less than b, then adding the same number to each of them, say c, gives us that a plus c is less than b plus c. Again, if we have the same two numbers a, which is less than b, and some number c that's positive, then we can say that a times c is less than b times c. If a is less than b and c is negative, then a c is going to be greater than BC. And if A is less than B and A times B is positive, then 1 over A, oops, then 1 over A is greater than 1 over B. When we're talking about the absolute value, we do know that it just means discard the sign, but we do have to have, instead of just discard the sign, a much more watertight mathematical definition. So what we say is if the thing between the signs is positive, so x is greater than or equal to zero, the absolute value is equal to that thing. If the thing behind the between the lines is negative, then the absolute value of it is the opposite. That says the opposite. Now let's have a look at x minus 4.3. We need to take both parts of the definition. So we're trying to solve this. So if if the bit in between 
is positive, then what we know is that the absolute value of this is going to be just itself. And from our question, the thing that we're trying to solve, we know that that's equal to 5.8. So that tells us that x is equal to 10.1. And if x minus 4.3 is negative, that's the other half of the definition, then the absolute value of x minus 4.3 is going to be the opposite of x minus 4.3, which is negative x plus 4.3, and that's got to be equal to 5.8. Then we can rearrange that to see that negative x is equal to 1.5, or that x is equal to negative 1.5. And if we're to draw that on a number line, what we've got is 4.3, 5.8 on the other side of that takes us up to 10.1 and 5.8 on the other side takes us to negative 1.5. So it's, it's a distance thing. So it's the distance to the right and the distance to the left. Most things, the moduli, it, it's a function, it actually has some rules. So let's look at the rules. The absolute value of a product is equal to the absolute value of x times the absolute value of y. If the absolute value of x is less than a and a is positive, then that tells us that, and this is just logic, that negative a is less than x, which is less than a. x plus y, the absolute value of x plus y doesn't equal the absolute value of x plus the absolute value of y. It is always going to be less than the sum of the parts. And you can check these with numbers. If we've got, um, this is just a tricky one, one that you might need to know, that a half of x plus y is greater than or equal to the square root of xy, providing x is positive and y is positive. These are we were using interval notation. And a square bracket means that we include the value. So in this one, we're including one and we're including three. The round bracket means we're not including one nor three. And then you can have a mixture of both. So for this one, say, we wouldn't include 1, and we would include 3. And our answer would be somewhere in between. And we could do for this one that we do include 1, but we don't include 3, and any of the numbers in between. For example, we were including negative 3. In our answer, we're including 4, so we would write it as the interval negative 3, 4 with closed brackets. The second example doesn't include 1, and it doesn't include 4, so we use round brackets. If we've got round brackets, then we are talking about an open interval. So we'd be talking about a set such that x is between a and b, but not including a or b, and assuming that x is a, a real number. If we're talking about a closed interval, we're talking about x is somewhere between a and x and b, but we're including a and b this time, like that. Prime numbers are useful. They're actually a really beautiful thing if you're mathematically inclined, but perhaps not otherwise. But a prime number is a positive integer that can be, or that can't be written as the product of two smaller integers. So one is not a prime number, but two 
is because it's two times one, three is because it's three times one, etc. And if you think about it, two must be the only even prime because anything more can be written as a product of, of two and something else. It's important sometimes to be able to find the highest common factor. It's the number that's a factor of all of the numbers. And sometimes it's useful to be able to find the lowest common multiple. Let's find the highest common factor, the highest common factor of 28 and 42. You can actually use your calculator when you've only got two of them, but you won't always have two. So let's write out 28 as prime factors. So we are prime factorizing 28. Let's prime factorize 42. And we can write that as 2 times 3 times 7. Now let's look at what's common. That's common. That's column common. So we can write that our highest common factor is 2 times 7, which is equal to 14. So the biggest number that goes into both 28 and 42 is 14. Now, if we want to find the lowest common factor of 11, 17, 21, and 100, again, let's prime factorize them. Well, 11 is prime, as is 17. And 21, that's not prime. And 100 is not prime either. Now, the quick, to, quick trick to do these is to set it up as a table. Write out your prime numbers. Write out the highest occurrence of those prime numbers. So our prime numbers are 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, and 17. And if we look at 2, we've got 2 of those. We've got 1, 3. We've got 2, 5s. We've got 1, 7, 1, 11, and 117. So our lowest common factor, uh, lowest common multiple is going to be 2 times 2 times 3 times the two fives times 7 times 11 times 17. And we need to use a calculator for that. 392700. Think about that for a minute, it's quite true. Good old common denominators. When we are adding or subtracting, we need to make sure that the bottom line, the denominator, is the same in each case. So for this one, we need to make the common denominator of 40. So we will do 9 over 10. Now, if we're going to multiply the 10 by something to equal 40, it's got to be times 4. So we've got to multiply the top by 4. And if we want to make the bottom line equal to 40, it's got to be times 10. So we've got to multiply the top by 10. So now we've got a common denominator. So we can say 36 minus 30, which is 6 over 40, which would be 3 over 20. 7 over 8 minus 1 over 6. Common denominator there would be 6 times 8, so 48. So 8 was multiplied by 6, so the 7 has to be multiplied by 6, minus the 6, 6 has to be multiplied by 8, so 6 times 1, so that would be 7 sixes of 42, minus, um, oops, a daisy, that's not quite right, I should have multiplied 1 by 8, so that was 8, over 48, so that's 42 minus 8, uh, that must be 34 over 48, so that would be 17 over 24. Similarly, if we've got three fractions or more than three, fr three fractions, 
we can proceed the same way. We can see there the common denominator will be 12, so it will be 1 over 12 minus 3 times 4 on the bottom, so it has to be 2 times 4 on the top, plus, now the bottom line is 4, so that's got to be times 3. We need to multiply the top line by 3, so then we've got a twelfth minus 8 twelfths plus 9 twelfths, which would be 2 over 12 or 1 over 6. Now we can do the same with algebra. And when we come to do algebra, we'll be able to simplify this a little bit more. But in the meantime, we can just do it using the same process. Common denominator is going to be x plus 1 times x plus 2 times x minus 1 in each case. All right, the first fraction was x plus 2, x plus 1 on the bottom, so it was multiplied by x minus 1, so 1 has to be multiplied by x minus 1. The second fraction was over x minus 1, so it needs to be multiplied by x plus 1, x plus 2, so we need to multiply 2 times x plus 1 times x plus 2. And for the last fraction, it was over x plus 2, so it needs to be multiplied by three times the other two bits that are in the denominator, x minus one, x plus one. And when we've done topic two, we'll simplify that. We can add fractions or subtract fractions um, when they are improper, so that they're bigger than, than the, the bottom half, the top is bigger than the bottom. Or we could split this one up. We could say that this is equal to two plus one plus three quarters plus a sixth and we could do it that way if it was subtraction if it was two and three quarters minus one and a sixth then we would have to say well that's two plus three quarters minus one plus a sixth which is equal to 2 plus 3 quarters minus 1 minus a sixth. Then we could tidy it up. We could say that's 2 minus 1 plus 3 quarters minus a sixth. And we could come out with 1 and 7 twelfths. And if we wanted to rewrite that as an improper fraction, we would say 12 times 1 plus 7, which would be 19 over 12. If we wanted to look at 49 over 12, we would say 49 divided by 12, that would be 12 into 49 goes 4 and 1 remainder, so 4 into 12. Multiplying three fractions is no different from multiplying 2, so we just multiply across the top, uh, 9 times 5 times 7 is 315 over 12 times 6 times 11, which is 792. And we could simplify that to being 35 over 88. A third of 51 means a third times 51. So it's 1 over 3 times 51 over 1, which would be 51 over 3, which is 17. Division of fractions, we have to invert the second fraction and multiply. So 3 over 8 divided by 5 over 6 is equal to 3 over 8 times 6 over 5, which is 18 over 40, which is 9 over 20. 9 over 3rd, if you think of division, uh, a fraction like this as division, and it says how many thirds in 9, you're not going to give the answer of three. You're going to actually do it properly. So you're going to either think about it or you're going to use the rule. So it's going to be nine over one times three over one. We invert and multiply. So it would be 27 over one, which is just 27. And that makes sense. There are 27 thirds in nine.